Well, this is the last part of our sermon series. This is the last in a series of three uh, sermons that we did on building faith. And, and actually, this sermon um, is, uh, is, is, again, about building faith. We're kind of finishing up that sermon series. There's more to come, though, because there's another couple of parts of what this mission statement has, has all been about. You know, during COVID, we talked about sort of what is it that we ultimately really want to be about as a church? Who are we? How do we understand um, how we broadcast that gospel message uh, in this particular way to the rest of the world? And it is in three ways, find community, build faith, reach beyond. So there's a lot more to come, but this sermon is actually a two-part sermon. This is the second part from last week. So from that last week to this week, if you haven't watched last week, that's okay, but I want you to go back if you haven't watched that and at some point watch or listen to that sermon because they really go hand in hand together. So I don't know if you're anything like me, but occasionally I browse the internet. Anybody out there browse the internet? You find your way around it every once in a while. Google shows you articles or something that you want to see based on your interest. I think, man, I think my phone listens to me because I'll have a conversation with somebody about something. All of a sudden, I'm getting ads on it. I know there's some sort of weird mumbo jumbo gives me the heebie-jeebies, but it's kind of interesting. And I guess they know that I think church is something important. And uh, I got this video sent to me, this video on the internet of a guy that I'll just call him like the bullhorn guy. Right? You remember the bullhorn guys that would like go out and then shout the gospel in the street using a bullhorn and might try to hit you up with a pamphlet or what they call like a little tract that's all about, you know, you know, you're going to hell. You you don't want to go to hell. You don't go to hell. Here's how you don't go to hell. And they're kind of yelling at you and all that stuff. And so this video, um, uh, this video is basically this guy who's on the subway and he goes into the subway and, uh, and I guess somebody just started taking the video somewhere in the midst of all this because he's just getting a ton of pushback from the people around him and yet he just keeps going and keeps going and going and people are just like literally telling him please stop talking get off the train they're just yelling back at him and I, I sort of when I saw the video I was just like I thought we were done doing that like that's still a thing like people still out there doing that and I remember the guys when I was in college you know and especially uh, young women would walk by and and they would just like be berating these young women for what they were wearing it was the it was the weirdest and craziest thing and then when I did some campus ministry in Atlanta same thing we'd actually as as, as the uh, campus ministry folks we got like a heads up from the dean of students who's like all right he's back he's going to be on campus alert your students so they know you know that this is going to be happening I mean, it was like a real thing i thought it was gone but nope still a real thing and that approach to sharing the story rarely does much more than just drive people away it usually makes people dig in their heels even further against faith and say, see, this is the problem. This is what we've been talking about the whole time. And living in the South, you probably had somebody ask you straight up out of the blue, oh, that's cool. So where do you go to church? I didn't know that was a question that was going to be asked to me growing up, but it was, it was asked to me all the time when I'd meet people. So where do you go to church? Like it was just an assumed thing that you went to church somewhere or even, even different was, uh, so, so are you saved? Do you know that you saved? How do you know that you're saved? We've got these questions growing up. And it's not really the bullhorn approach. That's one way. But it's more like the script approach. Like they've got an agenda or a little script that they've got sort of memorized so that when they come across you, they're just going to start peppering you with these questions. And there's usually a sort of a list of things that people say. I remember when I was in the seminary. This is great. We lived in a neighborhood like right around the seminary and all of us are like pastoral students. We're all like, you know, doing something in ministry, some sort of professional ministry. And these sweet old ladies in these most beautiful hats came to the door, you know, knocked on the door. And then I, I go to open the door and, uh, and I just said, uh, good afternoon, ladies. How can I help you? And I kid you not, the lady looks right, right from me, like straight in my eyes goes, sir, are you familiar with hellfire and brimstone? <laughs> like... Oh, okay. I thought maybe you were like selling insurance or something. And they were just so intense. I'm like, well, I mean, I do. I am aware of all of that stuff. Um, and, and, and she proceeds to kind of just give me a whole like, you know, intense sales pitch on why I should, you know, give my life to Jesus. And I'm like, well, I'm going to time out with you for a second because the, you're on a seminary 
um, property. So all of us here are, are studying to and have sort of given our lives to the Lord, like literally as we're going to be serving the Lord professionally for the rest of our lives. And it was just such a crazy thing because it didn't phase her, man. She had her notes, but she was just going and going and going. And it was just a thing. I think her heart was in the right place. I think their hearts are in the right place. I think the bullhorn guy's heart is in the right place. And all those people that ask me those questions all the time, their heart was in the right place, but their approach was abysmal because it was all about a transaction and it was missing relationship. It was all about a transaction and it was missing relationship. It was really just a one way dialogue. And this video I saw, it just brought a visceral reaction for me. Some, some good, some bad. I mean, his heart was hoping for transformation, the bullhorn guy on the subway. He was hoping for miracles, but the approach was all about transaction and it forgot relationship. In the video, people over and over again, they didn't want to receive the message that he was given. And here's what he was saying. Jesus loves you. Don't you understand? I love you. Why aren't you listening to me? And it was the strangest thing because this one guy's sitting there quiet and he's, you could see that he's just getting more and more frustrated and he just can't handle it anymore. And he's like, look, man, I don't care who loves me. I don't care who you love. I don't care about any of that stuff. I'm just trying to go to work. Could you please leave us alone? <laughs> Last week, Last week in my, in my sermon, I talked about everyday life. What does it mean to be in ministry in everyday life? We talked about this lineage of witness, right, that took us from Matthew 28, where the women heard the gospel for the first time and then were told to go ahead and tell that story and that Jesus would meet the rest of them in Galilee back in everyday life. There's a 2,000-year lineage of witness from that moment to you. And what an incredible thing that is. But there was way more to it in that 2,000 years than just bullhorning people, right? Last week, we talked about opportunities to share faith. And this week, I want to talk about how. Can I do a little teaching this morning, church? Can I do a little teaching? I'm excited about thinking about the how. First, before we jump into this, we're, we got to remember something. We're still in the Easter season. I'm still in the season of Easter. So we're going to actually use another Easter scripture. This one comes to us from Acts chapter 8. And it's really important to think about the historical context of the eunuch and sort of what's going on right now. So I'm going to talk about all of those things as we go throughout the scripture. Looking at Acts chapter 8, verse 26 through 40. I'm reading the NIV version this morning. Verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, it's helpful to remember, this is not Philip the disciple, all right? This is Philip who was chosen in Acts 6 to be one that would care for the poor, that would take the message to the poor. This is kind of Philip's thing. He, he was most certainly a witness, a great witness of the church, but he wasn't one of the disciples. It wasn't that Philip. He's another Philip. It's going to be a really big deal when you hear about what ultimately happens next. He was called to care for the poor. All right. Go south to the road, the desert road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. It's also important to remember a couple of things about this road. The direction of the road is very, very important. The guy that we're about to read about was just in Jerusalem. All right. So think that's the setting that they're laying. This person was just in Jerusalem. It's just after the death and resurrection and the institution of the Holy Spirit in the church. And it is literally called the desert road going from Jerusalem to Gaza. Verse 27. So he started out and on his way, he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of the Kandake, which means queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. Oh, this is such a cool and incredible moment. Remember to whom Philip was called. I just told you a second ago. This is Philip who was called to speak to who? The poor. This man, it says, was in charge of all the treasury all the money of the entirety of the queen of Ethiopia, the entire Kandake. This man was not 
poor. He was in charge of so much money, almost think like a major chunk of Africa. They would have probably heard this as he was in charge of the entirety of all the money for a continent. And the spirit told Philip, verse 29, go to that chariot and stay near it. Now, one last note on the Ethiopian eunuch. It's, the details are, are, are really important to scripture. When they give you those details, you got to always pay attention to it. Treasure. Okay, it says he was the treasure. Got it. He's rich. He's important. Ethiopian. Okay, got it. Really rich and really important, but also outsider. Not one of us. And it says that he was a eunuch. Okay, got it. I'll let you work that one out, parents at home. But he was not either able or allowed to have a family, which meant that he had one sole focus. His entire sole focus of his life was his job and his position. I know this is going to be speaking to somebody this morning. The entire focus of the Ethiopian eunuch's life was his job and his position. Verse 30. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you're reading? Philip asked. Remember I told you this is part two from last week. Okay. This is a big deal. How did it say that Philip approached the chariot? Do you remember? Just a second ago, verse 30. Then Philip ran. He ran. All right. So if you're taking notes at home. And you're thinking about, all right, we've got this, win this lineage of witness that's gotten me from there to here, this great and incredible opportunity to be a witness to the gospel. And you're like, okay, pastor, great. I, I'm all in. There's going to be an opportunity. How? So here's the how. Here's the how. I'm going to go through four parts as we get through the rest of this about how you can witness to somebody in your life. We know that our call is to do so. Here's the how, number one. Run toward your calling. Run toward your calling. Go. Remember, you get to be the one for somebody else. Philip was about to be the one to reveal the gospel to the Ethiopian eunuch, and so he ran. And God told him to go. He runs towards his calling. That moment changed everything. We used to do this series, it was a couple years ago, called That Moment Changed Everything. And we heard these amazing stories of when people had somebody witness into their life a whole new understanding of the gospel, or even a church that would witness into somebody's life in one case. And it was beautiful that we got a chance to be the one. Someone ran to you, ran at the opportunity to witness into your life. So therefore, whose moment will you be a part of? God said, go, and Philip ran. Oh, that we would run to the calling that God has for us. Then verse 31. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me? So he invited Philip to come and sit with him. Here's the how, number two. Just listen. Just listen. Most of the time, that is the hardest thing for us to do. I'm, I'm a talker. I, I get it. Some of the greatest witnesses I know, a French, he's a talker. We're both talkers. But one of the most important things that we can do is listen. And we, French, right? That's the best thing that we can do as be a listener to one who is interested in knowing more. I remember back in my sales days, back when I was in like the corporate America thing, and I was a classic overseller. It was, I was constantly getting, um, you know, great feedback from my, my partners at the organization uh, that I would go into a call and I would get the sale and I would actually have them say, yeah, you know what? We're in. We'll do that. Thanks, Matt. Uh, awesome. Sounds great. Let's get started. And then I would continue to sell. I just kept going. I just had more things to say. You don't have any idea how great this is going to be because we're going to do this, 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 and this. And also they're like, no, no, that's great. We're all in. Good stuff. No, no, no. I've got more to say. I always had more to say, but here's the thing, most of the time, all anybody wants is to be heard. Listening is the best gift that you can give to someone. I saw this other thing, <laughs> this picture that somebody sent me on the internet of a guy who was sitting under a tent somewhere in Texas, big old truck, I mean, it's Texas, right? He's sitting next to this big old truck in a tent and it's got a, he's got like a placard sitting out. He has two chairs. And he's just sitting there like doing a crossword puzzle or something like that. And it says, need somebody to talk to? I'll listen. It was simply that. 
he was just out there in the middle of a parking lot for everybody to see saying, need to talk? I'm happy to listen. It's one of the best gifts because it's the beginning of relationship. When somebody feels heard and then without relationship, anything that you might want to say gets lost. Verse 32. This is the passage of scripture that the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch said to Philip, tell me please, who is the prophet talking about? Himself or someone else? Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. Here's the how. Number three, bear the gospel. Bear the gospel. There is nothing else that you are called to say. There was an old seminary saying when we were there, when we were getting ready to preach, let the gospel do its job. You don't have to. The gospel will do its job. We believe in the living word of God. We believe that the, the word is alive, that, that it's the manger, right? You see the manger right here that holds Jesus, Luther said. That's how we reveal the gospel, is let the word do its work. The living word of God, it's alive and it's doing things in the lives of the people. Our job isn't to coerce or manipulate or strong arm. Our job isn't to sell people on anything. It's simply to bear the gospel. Jesus loves, forgives, walks with us. Jesus died and rose again in one day. So will we. We are an Easter people. Bear the gospel. Verse 36. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, here's water. It's one of my favorite lines in the whole of scripture. Look, here's water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Here's the how. Number four. Walk to the water together. Walk to the water together. Do you remember what they called this road early on in scripture? Do you remember what they called it? Yeah, it was the road from Jerusalem to Gaza. But would they say what kind of road it was? They said it was a desert road. It is a desert road. It's known as a desert road. I want you to hear something. If you tuned out, tune back in right now for this moment because when God is calling you to bear the gospel, God will put water on a desert road. When God is calling you to bear the gospel, God will put water on a desert road. God laid that water in that basin long before they came to it. And think about all the things that had to happen just to get water to that moment for the Ethiopian eunuch in the midst of a desert. I mean, think about the timing that had to take place for that very moment for him to see the water there. God called him to the water and the Ethiopian sees it and says, hey, there's water. What's to prevent me too from being baptized, to being connected to this Easter people that you speak of? I want to know what that is. There's water on a desert road. God will give you the moment for invitation. God will give you that moment to walk to the water together. Maybe it's an invitation to church or, or small group or, or something church related. That, that's fantastic but it might be an invitation to that person to go grab a beer or a coffee for more conversation, to have an opportunity to be able to bear that gospel. Maybe it's an invitation to grab a meal together. Maybe it's an invitation to a deeper relationship. We can't forget Philip's reaction to this calling, right? God says, hey, Phil, <laughs> he called him Phil, go to that chariot up there. Philip's inclination was probably that he was not an idiot. And as he's looking at this person, he probably knows kind of what's going on. Imagine running up 
to this thing. This, this is crazy. God, they're going to kill me. They'll think I'm a robber. I'm supposed to just go up to this chariot on a desert road. I mean, typically that's what robbers do. They run up to chariots on desert road. He runs. Imagine this. If you tried to run up to an armored vehicle sitting outside of Walmart with the guys walking out with the bags, all right? You go run up to one of those armored vehicles. You're not going to live. At least you're going to be at gunpoint pretty fast. That's the craziness of this moment. No, but Philip is ready to do whatever it takes to share the good news with the poor. And remember, the Ethiopian wasn't poor, but yet he was. He had all the money and all the power in the entire world at that time. He could have done anything that he wanted. He had a chariot to take him 1,500 miles from one place to another. He went to Jerusalem, perhaps because he just wanted to know what was going on and has all the way home yet to go, him and his chariot, with everything that he could need. And yet, he's in need of everything. He had all the world that could give him, but there was so much more. And it makes me think about the bullhorn guy I saw in the video. When I was in Atlanta after worship each day, each week, we used to make peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. I know it was kind of crazy, but after worship, but they weren't for the congregation. We would actually finish worship and head out the doors with those peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And we would actually just walk to all of the homeless in Atlanta, just in the few blocks surrounding the church. There were so many. And we would give them a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, a glass of lemonade, and ask them if we could pray for them. And the incredible things that we heard and saw when we just went out beyond our doors blew us away. Because for so many people, the gospel was a peanut butter and jelly sandwich and some conversation. That's it. To just know that they weren't invisible anymore. And the craziest thing is in this video, the bullhorn guy appears to be holding groceries (laughs) while he's doing his bullhorn thing in the middle of the subway. He's got bags on either arm while he's talking. And it appears that in those bags, are bottles of water and boxes of granola bars. And in this video, if you look past the bullhorn guy and the frustrated people and the guy that calls out the bullhorn guy that's sitting on the subway, right towards the back, there's a man sitting there that's clearly living out of his backpack. Steps away. See, in his quest for transaction, He missed the opportunity for relationship. And he had everything that he needed to go and care for that one. What a missed opportunity. What might life look like if he had stopped this transactional mayhem and looked for the relationship, sat on the ground, offered a meal and a bottle of water, and made someone who felt invisible feel visible and important and loved makes me wonder who in our lives who in your life feels invisible today feels unloved uncared for uncalled verse 39 when they came up out of the water the spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away and the eunuch didn't see him again but went on his way rejoicing. The word that they said rejoicing is like hailing, as if to a king, which means that this treasurer of the entire continent of Africa went on his way praising a new king in a new way. Philip, however, appeared to Azotus and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Brothers and sisters, this story is way more than just this moment. The Ethiopian eunuch was probably the least likely evangelist, but is thought to have started the entirety of the church in Africa and beyond. He was like a super Gentile because he didn't look like the Jews. He looked completely different. So not only was he an outsider, he was a mega outsider, a super Gentile. And it's said that the gospel was revealed 
through so many, for so many through him. He was the beginning of the outsiders being a part of the kingdom. Brothers and sisters, God is doing incredible things in you. No matter who you are, no matter if you're a kid, no matter if you're a young adult, and no matter if you're a young professional or a senior citizen or somewhere in between, God is doing incredible things in you and God can use you. And not just God can, but God will. And God's brought an entire lineage and witness to the moment with you so that you can therefore go and continue that line and share that beyond yourselves. There are people around you who feel invisible and yet you are the one who's gonna see them. You have the gospel in you and that gospel is meant for a world waiting to hear it. So run toward your calling and just listen. Bear the gospel and walk to the water together. Here's the how. So church, where is God calling, where is God calling you to build faith? Let's pray. Good and gracious God, we give you thanks and praise this day because one day we felt invisible, but you made us visible. You brought the gospel to us. Help us to be bold, Lord, to be unafraid, to go and share the witness of the Easter promise, the Easter story. That you love us no matter what. And Lord, when that moment comes, Put water on the desert road. Give us the opportunity, the resources to build relationship with someone else so that they can have a relationship with you. You called us forth, Lord. Now call us out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, now is the time to gather your communion supplies and we're going to walk through communion together. That's, that's how we have the energy as we share communion. Jesus Christ within us, the gospel made flesh within us as we go forth to help and heal a hurting world.